Thank you to Trade Coffee for supporting this episode of SciShow. You can go to drinktrade.com slash scishow to get a free bag of coffee with any subscription purchase. Close your eyes and picture the most typical planet in the galaxy. Is it small and rocky or giant and gassy? Maybe somewhere in between? Well, whatever planet is swirling around in your mind, it's probably basking in the light of a nearby star. And that's where your picture is wrong. It turns out most planets don't orbit stars. They're incredibly difficult to find. But over the past decade, astronomers are learning just how abundant these free-floating planets, also known as rogue planets, are. And in doing so, they're shifting not just how we think about planets, but how we ponder our place in the universe. So how do you make a rogue planet? Astronomers have identified a few ways it can happen, and some might require stretching our current definition of what a planet is. First, you've got your standard planetary formation story with what might seem like a downer ending. As a baby star forms, it's surrounded by a big disk of gas, dust, rock, and ice. Thanks to gravity and a series of dramatic collisions, some of that debris ends up condensing into bodies large enough for astronomers to deem them planets. But gravity is also responsible for making some of these new worlds go rogue. It could be a planetary sibling or a random star just minding its own business on its trip through interstellar space, but if something big gets a bit too close, it could gravitationally tug on a planet in just the wrong way and knock it out of its system. Next, you have what's called core collapse. This is when a big blob of dust and gas floating in the middle of cosmic nowhere has enough mass that gravity just squishes it down to form a planet. And if you're thinking, hey, that sounds like how stars form, well, you're right. It's the same idea, just with way less mass involved. But speaking of how stars form, you could also get a free-floating planet if a star is trying to form, but something interrupts the process. Maybe a bunch of bodies in a stellar nursery do their own gravitational jostling and kick one out before it grows big enough. Or maybe the energetic stellar wind shooting out of one star blows away a bunch of gas that another had worked really hard to accumulate. Either way, there isn't enough mass in the picture, so you don't get a star, you get yourself a very gassy planet. While we know rogues can form under any of these conditions, we don't actually know which is the most or least common. Maybe most rogue planets did start out having a parent star, or maybe their origins are more diverse. One of the things keeping us from answering that question is just how hard it is to find rogue planets in the first place. It's hard enough to find bound planets, the ones zipping around stars, and the most common planet-finding techniques kind of require there to be a star. First off, we have the transit method, where scientists track a star's brightness over time, and if that brightness dips by the same amount over and over again at regular intervals, intervals, researchers know they found an orbiting planet. The radial velocity method also involves watching starlight, but it focuses on the color of the light, not its brightness. Basically, as a planet orbits a star, its own gravity makes the star wiggle around. While the planet pulls the star away from us, the star's light looks redder, and while the planet pulls the star toward us, the light looks bluer. If that redder to bluer shift happens on a regular schedule, you've got yourself a planet. Astrometry is also wiggle-based, but it's looking for the actual movement of the star in space. And finally, we've got direct imaging, just looking at the planet. But for now, the technology we have isn't great for just scanning the skies and seeing what's out there. It works best on preset targets, like stars that might have planets around them. Now, even for bound planets, these methods aren't foolproof. For one thing, they're biased towards finding big, hot planets that are either super close to their stars, or in the case of direct imaging, super far away. But rogue planets can't really be found using these methods at all. They're tiny dark blobs floating amidst a similarly dark cosmic sea. Luckily for astronomers, you don't have to see a planet to know that it's there. Gravitational microlensing allows them to find rogue planets by observing how an otherwise invisible clump of matter distorts light they can see. You've probably seen the effect of gravitational lensing on massive galaxy clusters. This one is my favorite, because it makes a smiley face. What's happening here is that the mass in a galaxy cluster distorts the fabric of space-time itself. It acts like a lens, and any light coming from a galaxy behind that cluster gets bent all out of shape. The light also gets magnified, and astronomers often take advantage of this quirk of physics to study things that are dim and far away. And that technique is called gravitational lensing. Meanwhile, in gravitational microlensing, you use the warped light to study the lens itself. And yeah, that lens can be as small as a planet. When a rogue planet briefly passes between us and a random background star, it will cause a microlensing event. A combination of how much brighter the starlight appears and how long the 
event lasts tells astronomers how much mass the lens has. Now, just like all our other planet hunting methods, this works best on larger objects like gas giants or even more massive brown dwarfs, which are this sort of intermediary object between planets and stars. The first planet ever discovered using microlensing was spotted in 2003, and it was over twice the mass of Jupiter. The first microlensing survey of rogue planets was published in 2011. And based on the results, the authors estimated that for every star in the galaxy, there are roughly two rogue planets about the mass of Jupiter. But that estimate was based on a very small data set, and it didn't really take lower mass rocky planets into account. Over the years, newer studies would propose their own. And the latest one, released in 2023, is a bit of a doozy. It comes from the Microlensing Observations in Astrophysics Collaboration, or MOA, and claims that there are anywhere from 8 to 44 rogue planets for every star, compared to an estimated 3.2 to 4.3 bound planets. Which means there could be as many as 10 rogue worlds out there for every bound one. While the study hasn't officially completed the peer review process, experts think it's a solid estimate. The whole MOA survey is built off of over 3,500 potential microlensing events, and each potential incident passed a hefty qualification criteria before it was added to the final dataset. After gathering that microlensing data, the team worked to construct a mass function for our galaxy's free-floating planets. A mass function is basically a model that charts how many bodies you've got with different masses, whether it's a cluster of stars that all formed from the same stellar nursery, or all the rogue planets in the Milky Way. Here's one of the mass functions the MOA team produced. You can see that there are a bunch more planets with smaller masses. These would be rocky bodies similar in mass to, or even less massive than the Earth. So it might be easier to find Jupiter-sized worlds, but that doesn't mean that's what's mostly out there. Based on their mass function, the team could compare the collective mass of all the rogue planets out there to that of all stars. Our Sun is above average in mass, but astronomers use it as a reference point. Point anyway. And for every solar mass of star, there looks to be between 88 and 368 Earth's worth of rogue planets. To translate that into a number of planets and not the total mass, that would depend on the mass range they considered. Like, if they only looked at gas giants, it would be a lot smaller, because you'd have to pack a lot more of that mass into each individual planet. But the team didn't just look at gas giants. They considered planets with masses all the way from just one-third of an Earth to over 20 times the mass of Jupiter. And that's how they got got 8 to 44 rogue planets per star. Now, you might be looking at that estimate and thinking, well, that's a pretty large margin of error. And you're right but it's to be expected. For one thing, astronomers need to hedge their bets because microlensing can't always tell the difference between a rogue planet and a bound planet that has a very wide orbit. We'll have to wait for better equipment to narrow those error bars. But lucky for us, we won't have to wait too long. The Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope is on track to launch around 2026 or 2027. If all goes to plan, it's going to be as much of a big deal for exoplanet research as the web is for infrared research. Roman comes equipped with a wide field instrument that's just as sensitive of his Hubble's, but the field of view is a hundred times bigger. Astronomers expect Roman to provide a rogue planet count that's at least ten times more precise than our current one. Eventually, we may learn that the number of rogues is closer to eight per star than a whopping 44, but whatever it ends up being, experts believe they'll outnumber bound worlds. And one day, they might actually be able to answer why rogues are more abundant. But we don't have to wait for that answer to ponder an even more important question. What does this mean for us? From a scientific perspective, the revelation that your average planet isn't orbiting one of the oodles and oodles of stars out there suggests that stellar system formation might be even more melodramatic and complicated than astronomers expected. And it poses some great follow-up questions, too. Like, did Earth lose a whole bunch of siblings that we could find if we looked hard enough? Or is there some way that these rogue worlds could be habitable for some kind of alien critter? Or if it turns out most of the planet-sized balls in our galaxy never orbited a star in the first place, do we have to sit through yet another round of astronomers redefining what a planet is? But maybe it's more interesting to think of what this shift in our understanding means to humanity. While we'll never go back to being the center of the universe, scientists have become more and more convinced that our solar system is odd. And now, not only is our solar system a little funky, but stellar systems might be a little funky themselves. So keep that in mind next time you're pondering your place in the universe. While Earth revolves around the sun, some of our worlds revolve around coffee. And to keep them going, 
there's Trade Coffee. Trade connects you to over 55 roasters in the US, offering over 450 coffees. Whether you like dark roasts, espresso, blends, or rare roasts, you can find it at Trade Coffee. With so many options, they keep you from getting overwhelmed by guiding you through the process and matching you to coffees uniquely suited to your taste. Once you've picked the perfect coffee, it's roasted within 48 hours and shipped directly to you so you can enjoy it in your own home or office. Here at the SciShow office, we tried their milk and honey blend, which is made specifically to taste good with milk, although it also tasted good without it. It's an aromatic dark roast and it's just a classic cup of coffee. And it came in an easily resealable bag, which I personally am a huge fan of. If you want to try it for yourself, you can go to drinktrade.com scishow to get a free bag of coffee with any subscription purchase. And thank you to Trade Coffee for supporting this episode of SciShow. 